Hi, I'm Neil Mangan, and today I'm going to be presenting the paper Building Predictive Models via Feature Synthesis by Arnaldo Riley and Vera Machinanini at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, CSAIL. So in this picture, they're interested in creating a very fast way to generate nonlinear models to do data fitting. So the problem is they have some set of input, measured input variables x, and they have a measured response variable y that is some nonlinear composition of those measured variables x. And they want to know how can we generate a model to fit this data quickly. Um, so the main scheme that people generally think about how to solve this problem is they have uh, some, the data that they would like to be able to describe, uh, some, sub, some number of models that they've created that are nonlinear, and some method for measuring whether these models work well in fitting the data. Um, so the, one of the main focuses of this paper is how to quickly generate these models. Um, and all right. So a previous method for generating those models is uh, evolutionary uh, generation. So they start with some initial seeded model, and they perform mutations off of that model, either random or sometimes uh, combining models together that work well, to produce some subset of new models in a generation two. And then, then they mutate or, uh, and generate a new subset of models. And so each generation is then uh, of the models are compared against each other. Often this method is done using a symbolic evolutionary uh, type method where you're keeping, you're symbolically storing these model structures um, at each step. And then when you want to evaluate, you have to go down either every branch of the tree to compare. Um, and you'll also notice that this can get very, very complex very quickly um, after a, a few generations. Uh, so generally speaking, the authors were concerned with this sort of technique because trees are slow, and um, they wanted to reduce the complexity of the problem. There's also a repetitiveness within this type of structure. So for example, you'll notice this equation F2 has an x1 linear term, as does this equation uh, F4. So uh, the authors wanted to do something to reduce the repetition of storage, um, get around having to use something like a symbolic technique to store the models and that was but they still wanted to keep this evolutionary generation uh, because that seems to be pretty good at exploring the type of model space that you might need to fit these type of problems um, so in order to achieve their goal of faster model generation evaluation and selection uh, they, the big idea that the authors had was to treat the features, not the models. They then compose these features iteratively in a method that's inspired by the genetic uh, algorithm technique. Um, and they use a sparse regression on the linear combination of those features and then a correlation criteria to select which features to keep for the next generation. So let's talk about what do we mean by features, not models. So if I write down a model F1 as this combination of terms, um, you'll note that basically each one of these terms is, could be considered a feature. So we're now going to do all of our evolution and all of our um, evaluation on these features. So x1, uh, cosine, for example, uh, x2 squared, the log of x1. And in order to compose, or in order to turn all of these features into a model, we just do a linear combination of all of those features weighted by these beta coefficients. Um, and you'll, one of the things to note is that um, you don't need to store these features symbolically because when we started, the data we had, so x1, was just some um, vector of x1 values uh, that we got experimentally. So you can actually store each of these features um, as that, you know, plugging that data into whatever your coefficient is. And if you then want to create, you know, combine these in different ways, you can just combine those vectors as opposed to storing the symbols. Um, all right, so a little more 
about that. So how do how does how do those features fit into this idea of creating generation after generation of iteratively composed um, features? So the authors first have some pool of operators that they're going to use to compose the features from one generation to another. So the operators are just you know your plus minus times uh, divide, exponent log, square root, square, cube, sign, et cetera. So you could imagine adding more powers or more um, you know, tangent or whatever you want to this operator pool. Then they start with uh, their generation one features. And so the generation one features are just each of their measured variables, um, the linear form of them. So x1, x2, out to however many features they have or however many uh, measured variables they have, xp. Uh, generation 2 then takes these generation 1 features and composes them together using operators from the operator pool. So for example, they would take the plus operator and randomly select x1 and x2, so that's the h1 and h2 features from that previous generation to create a new generation of features x1 plus x2. And it, you know, it could be that it requires two features like the plus minus multiply divide type uh, um, operators, or it could be that it only requires one previous generation feature. So for example, log x2 sine x1. Um, so now, in order to get to the third generation of features, um, there's going to be some sort of evaluation on this generation of features. You're going to end up with Q of these new uh, features. And we're keeping this original generation of features, because if you now want to compose a new generation of features, you want your operators to be able to act on these original linear variables and these new set of features that you've gotten from your generation two. So generation three is now going to be those original features plus all of the features that survived whatever evaluation you're doing from generation two plus some new composition using these operators on all of those remaining features. So for example, you might take uh, XP from your first generation and compose it with the divide operator with this X1 plus X2 or the HP plus one term uh, feature from your generation two to get this um, generation three feature. So generation three is now um, H1, H2, H3 through HP plus Q uh, plus all of these new features out to um, HP plus Q plus mu. And so the total number of features ends up being exactly that. Uh, the, all of the terms from your first generation, the ones that have survived from your previous generation, uh, plus the new ones that you're adding to the pool. And now we want to generate, we want to be able to evaluate which of these features are actually useful for describing the behavior in our current generation. Uh, so the method for determining and selecting um, and evaluating these features is they want to use sparse regression on linear combinations of the feature population. So one method for doing sparse regression is lasso, or the least absolute shrinkage and selector operation. And basically what this has is you are taking the difference between your measured response variables and the linear combination of your feature library with these coefficients beta. So remember, this is just the, that, you know, the features you have with the data plugged in. So this is just numbers. And this is also just numbers from your measured uh, data. So the, what you're trying to determine is a, what essentially is a L1 regression or an L2 regression problem to determine these beta coefficients. Um, in order to impose sparsity, meaning to have a lot of these beta values go to zero so that you're not keeping every single term, you're only keeping the important ones, uh, Lasso also has a uh, L1 regularization term, which as the parameter lambda gets larger and larger, more and more of the beta values are going to go to zero because it's using an L1 type norm on those beta values. Um, now, he would, it would be great if imposing this sort of algorithm meant that you always got all of your beta values that should be zero, meaning they shouldn't be contributing to your fit, uh, to go to zero, but that doesn't, is not necessarily ensured by um, this method. Additionally, uh, you have a free variable lambda that you have to have some way of selecting for. So in order to address both of those issues and be able to use this um, sparse regression, uh, the authors come up with another way of both keeping 
the problem from getting, or the models from getting too complex, meaning the features libraries from getting too complex, and um, selecting how many terms they're going to keep. So they use a fixed model size, and they select only the top terms using, some, using an importance measure. And this importance measure is defined as the sum of the multiple correlation coefficient, so that's r, um, times basically whether or not the beta for that lambda value is zero or not. So if it's zero, then the term does not um, contribute. If it's one, or if beta is non-zero, then the uh, multiple correlation coefficient does contribute. And it's the sum over all of lambda. So this allows, basically what this is saying is if feature H contributes greatly to a good fit for that model over all lambda values, then that feature is going to be ranked very highly. So uh, you know you have some list of features with some rank based on this importance measure, and then you just apply some cutoff given the fixed model size. Now the problem, or one of the issues that comes up when you use this sort of selection um, is that some features will be highly correlated. So for example, cosine x squared and the exponent of cosine, exponential of cosine x squared uh, are both very, very similar. In fact, cosine is just, cosine x squared is going to be the linear approximation of the exponent of cosine x squared. So those two, um, ter because those two features are so similar, they're actually going to be, they're going to end up splitting the importance measure between them. And so even though uh, essentially something that looks like these two features should be important enough to end up before your cutoff, because they're splitting the importance, they end up below the cutoff and thrown out. So in order to address this, uh, the authors add a correlation filtering. And so they say, if I have um, a feature from generation X, and in generation X plus one, I add a new feature, but these two features are very highly correlated. Um, in this case, they use the Pearson correlation coefficient. So if that's greater than 0 0.95 between these two features, then they're going to discard the new one and only keep the old one. So this is really quick. Uh, the mean squared error, as they do iterations of uh, producing new generations of features and testing and fitting the model, and basically they find that this yellow line, which is without imposing the correlation coefficient uh, threshold, um, does not converge as fast or reduce the mean square error as fast as the blue line when they do. All right, so overall the algorithm is let's generate uh, our original features that are just in your original p measured variables x, um, compose those into a linear combination of all of the features, uh, and to generate the first model. Apply lasso to determine your beta values. Now compose all of those features into a next generation of features um, of feature library using your operators. Select from some subset of those features using again lasso to find the betas for the new feature library, and rank the feature importance, and then apply a cutoff for the subset selection of those features. So that now you have a, the successful features from your generation one model. Now plug them back in at the beginning and repeat over and over again until you have um, a model that either the mean squared error is no longer decreasing as you go through, iterate through the algorithm or uh, you have some time threshold. So the authors um, benchmark this method on a number of different data sets against a number of different other methods. Um, the data sets include energy efficiency of heating and cooling loads, NOx emissions, red and white quality data sets. This one's interesting because not only are there physical measurements of the wine, but there's also subjective measurements of how people view the wine. And then the million song data set uh, was a challenge. It was an enormous data set. And the challenge was to predict, use the information in the data set to try and predict the release year of some set of songs. Um, the methods that they benchmark against are these three linear methods, so multiple linear regression, a lasso linear regression, and the Valpal-Wabbitt sparse gradient descent linear 
uh, it, which is also a linear method, or it fits to a linear model. Um, they compare against the feed, a feed-forward neural network, and which deals, you know, is known to deal well with nonlinear type data sets and a multiple regression genetic programming, which this, this type of method, which also uses LASSO, was the original uh, um, idea of how to use this genetic programming method to create, uh, ran, you know, to create your model set. Um, and then the evolutionary feature synthesis model is the model presented in this paper, or the method presented in this paper. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you a subset of the benchmarks that they did. So here's the energy and efficiency of heating data. And they have, again, the mean squared error on the y-axis and the different types of models. And then I've put the time here that it took to reach that mean squared error for each uh, method below here. So basically, these linear models are very, very fast, but produce, for this particular data set, a bad mean squared error. And that's mostly because this particular data set is highly nonlinear. It's the one that I showed at the beginning. Um, these other methods, so the neural net and the genetic programming, all produce good mean squared errors, at least compared to the linear models. But um, the feed for neural net is very fast. The uh, multiple regression genetic programming is quite slow, comparatively. And uh, the evolutionary feature synthesis is somewhere in the middle. Um, so here's the NOx emission from power plants. And basically, it looks like maybe all of these models uh, or all these methods produce models that are comparable in mean squared error, except for this one. Uh, again, the linear methods are very fast. And in this case, for some reason, the evolutionary feature synthesis model is not actually that much faster than um, the multiple regression genetic programming model. And again, the feedforward network is only about an order of magnitude slower than uh, the linear methods. Um, it looks like the red wine quality data set is well described by linear models, and there's not really that much improvement with the nonlinear methods. So that's what using these methods on that type of data set uh, creates. And um, here's an example where the feed neural net does very well, the evolutionary feature synthesis model does slightly better, and all of the rest of them do around the same. Um, again, and in this case, all of these nonlinear methods end up being around the same amount of time, with it, although the multiple regression genetic programming is still slower than the evolutionary feature synthesis. So in summary, linear models are fast, but they don't work very well when you have not highly nonlinear data. Uh, Feed-forward neural networks are really the fastest nonlinear uh, type of data fitting method you can use, at least in this case. However, the downside is they produce completely uninterpretable models. And this was you know, one of the reasons for using this sort of multiple regression genetic programming or the evolutionary feature synthesis, was that both of these type of methods will produce what is essentially a basis expansion of the model that might be able to be interpreted by domain experts. And the author, you know, the authors have shown that basically this evolutionary feature synthesis method um, not only produces a basis expansion faster than the multiple regression genetic programming method, but it produces a more constrained expression, uh, which means that it's probably even more readable than the multiple regression genetic programming. Uh, the authors have made their code available at this website. It's open source and on GitHub. Um, it's written in Java, and they have a short tutorial on how to do at least one, one of the problems, the uh, heating and cooling um, problem that's in the manuscript. Uh, so that's been my presentation of building predictive models via feature synthesis. Thank you.